Hi, this is Dr. John Bergdorf. In this video, we're going to look at one of the four main methods for solving quadratic equations. Just as a reminder, a quadratic equation is an equation that has the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. The distinguishing characteristic of a quadratic equation is the existence of this x squared term. So we'll see uh, some of these as we go. This method involves factoring uh, and also uses a property known as the zero product theorem. Now the zero product theorem is actually a very simple idea that at first glance may not seem to have any connection to quadratic equations. It says simply this, that if A and B are real numbers and A times B equals zero, then either A equals zero or B equals zero. Saying that in words in a way that probably will be make more sense, I think, we simply say this. If the product of two numbers is zero, at least one of those numbers must equal zero. And I think if you think about that, imagine two numbers and that when you multiply them together you get zero. There's only one way that can happen. Either one or both numbers has to equal zero. Now, how on earth is that relevant to solving quadratic equations? Let's do some examples. In, in this video, all of our examples are going to have polynomials where the leading coefficient is 1. Um, in the next set of videos, we'll have some where the leading coefficient is something else. But let's talk about how to do this. Basically, this simple theorem inspires a three-step process. So here's a, a, a quadratic equation that I want to say, uh, solve, and my first step is this, get zero on one side of the equation. Remember the principle of balance, whatever mathematical operation you do on one side of the equation, if you do the same thing on the other side of the equation, you don't change the solutions, it's equivalent. So this would be actually pretty easy to do. In fact, you could probably just do it in your head, but I'll, I'll say the steps one time here. If I subtract 14 from both sides of this equation, that's a perfectly legal thing to do, and that would give me a zero on the right. So my equation has a new form, x squared plus 5x minus 14 equals zero. That's easy enough. Let me just rewrite the equation here so I don't forget it. x squared plus 5x minus 14 equals zero. Step two says factor the other side of the equation. Uh, it's a quadratic expression, a trinomial. We should be able to factor that by trial and error. In fact, what we would be looking for is we need to think about are there two numbers whose product is negative 14 but whose sum is 5? And that will inspire how this factors. And I think you can see pretty easily that if I factor that as x plus 7 times x minus 2, then that indeed would give me x squared plus 5x minus 14. 7 times negative 2 is negative 14. 7 plus negative 2 is 5. So this um, reminds us of what we've learned recently in factoring. The difference is that this is now an equation with an equal 0 in it. Now, here's where the zero factor theorem comes into play. What I essentially have here is a statement that says that the product of two numbers is zero. There's only one, only two ways that can happen. One of those factors has to equal zero. So what you do to find the solutions is you simply take each one of those factors and you set them equal to zero to see what value of x would make that happen. Set x plus seven equals zero, and at the same time set x minus 2 equals 0. That gives you linear equations, uh, equations with no exponents on the variable, and you can solve them very simply. Just use the principle of, ba balance, principle of balance to get the x by itself. I'll show the steps one more time, and then I don't think we need to after that. Um, if I subtract 7 from both sides in this small equation, I will get x is equal to negative 7. And if I add 2 to both sides of this simple equation, 
that will give me x equal 2. And that implies that my solution set, which we're not surprised about uh, because it's quadratic, has two solutions in it, negative 7 and positive 2. You can go back and check these. That's optional, um, and I'm going to skip over that, but you can check these if you like. Three steps. Get 0 on one side, factor the other side, set each factor equal to 0. Let's do a couple more examples just to solidify that. So, solve the equation x squared plus 25x equals 10, plus 25, sorry, equals 10x. I first need to get a 0 on one side. I can do that by subtracting 10x. Here's where I'm going to begin to skip a few steps. Subtract 10x from both sides. And you'll notice that what I'm doing is I'm putting the terms in the so-called correct order. Uh, decreasing degree of terms, the exponents going down. Kind of the form that we're used to seeing when we try to factor a trinomial. The, uh, the commutative law tells me I can put these terms in any order I want. Then I, that was step one, get a zero on one side. Step two, factor the other side. So I can look for two numbers whose product is 25 and whose sum is negative 10, or I can recognize that this is a perfect square trinomial. Notice that you've got a perfect square in the first position and in the last position. 25 happens to be 5 squared, and the middle term is 2 times 5 times x. So this actually will factor as a perfect square, if you don't see that, it's no big deal. Use your usual trial and error type factoring. This will factor as x minus 5 squared, or if you prefer, x minus 5 times x minus 5. Then, we don't need all that, then we set each factor equal to zero, keeping in mind that these two expressions, these two equations mean exactly the same thing. We realize that we just have a repeated factor, and if I set each factor equal to zero, I'll actually get the same solution twice, namely x is equal to 5. And at first glance, you might say, well, gee, that's um, a bit of a problem because aren't quadratic equations supposed to have two solutions? Well, really it does. Because we have the same factor twice, we get the same solution twice. Five appears twice. Now, when you write your solution set, you really only have to write the five one time. But you can kind of remember that that five is duplicated. It has multiplicity two using some very fancy language. So that's another nice example. Now here's another one. And this one is designed not to trick you, but um, to inspire what may be a warning. You see on the left side, it's already factored. And so you think, oh, no problem. I'll set each factor equal to what's on the right. But the zero factor theorem really says that it's only when you have a product of numbers equal to zero that one of those factors equals zero. This is not a zero. So we can't set x plus one equal 12 and x minus three equal 12. That won't work. We have to be a bit more meticulous. And there's a little bit more to do here. Um, the left side, you might notice, is a product of two binomials. Let's multiply those out. Multiply the left side using, if you will, the FOIL rule. First, outside, inside, last. The product of the first terms would be x squared. The product of the out times, outside terms would be negative 3x. The inside terms would be 1x. And the product of the last terms would be negative 3. Don't forget the 12 over here. Combine like terms. x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 12. And now we're beginning to look a lot like the other examples. We would want to get a 0 on one side, so let's subtract the 12. Subtract 12 from both sides. I'll show one partway step here. If I subtract 12 from both sides, it would look like this. I can combine the like terms. x squared minus 2x minus 15 equals 0. That's getting a 0 on one side. Then factor the other side. 
Looking for two numbers whose product is negative 15 and whose sum is negative 2. How about x minus 3, uh, excuse me, not x minus 3, x plus 3, and x minus 5. That would do it. That would, uh, 3 times negative 5 is negative 15. 3 plus negative 5 is negative 2. So get a 0 on one side, factor the other side, set each factor equal to 0, and I see that I will get two distinct solutions, negative 3 and positive 5. Put those in a solution set, and you are done. Now, there is one drawback to this method. Let me throw in one more example. Suppose I wanted to solve x squared minus 11x plus 2 equals 0. It's already got the 0 on one side. But I go to factor this, and I, it tells me I need to look for two numbers whose product is 2 but whose sum is negative 11, and I have no such pair of numbers that will do that. This does not factor. And that leaves me with a quandary. The factoring method is not going to help us here. So we're going to have to discover in another video some alternative method that would allow me to solve an equation, a quadratic equation, when the quadratic expression won't factor.